Welcome to our worship this morning as we sing praises to our God and King. Have you ever gone out into a dense wilderness in the middle of the night just to escape from the city lights and be able to look up at the stars and see them as they truly are, glittering like diamonds against a black velvet sky? Well, it's in times like those that remind us just how awesome God is, just how awesome this God who created the universe is. But he's not just the creator of those magnificent night skies or sunsets or sunrises. He's also the God who is right here with us, right by our side, holding our hand when we're sick, weeping with us when we cry, he sweats, he prays, and he feels anger, pain, and joy. And he longs, he longs, brothers and sisters, to be in a constant, passionate relationship with each of us. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondages of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This lesson, Paul reminds us of that grace, sheer goodwill on God's part, undeserved by us, brings us to God. Therefore, humility marks Christian living. No boasting, no self-assertion, but an eagerness to help others find their way to Christ is the name of the game. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, 
and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I become weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus begins his ministry of teaching and healing. Truly, in the early days of his ministry, he was the talk of the town. Everyone was looking for him. Listening to Mark's gospel reproduces the astonishment of those early days. Mark 1, verses 29 through 39. After Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons.
It's really cold outside, but I hope I have what is a heartwarming saying to start us off with today. It's from St. Augustine, and it's a saying that I think every Christian should know and treasure. I hope to send you off with this saying into the week and into the rest of your lives. Many of you will heard it, perhaps. Around the year 400 AD, in his Confessions, Augustine wrote, Our heart is restless, O Lord, until it finds its rest in thee. Our heart is restless, O Lord, until it finds its rest in thee. Many of you, again, will know this statement and its author, but I have a hunch that many of you who've never heard of Augustine and never heard that quotation will know its truth. Because if you're in the church, if you're a believer in God, if you've given yourself to Christ, if you've put yourself in the realm of discipleship, however we put those things, uh, you know that that captures what you found out to be true. Only God, only God, the maker of human life, can satisfy the heart's deepest longing. Only God, the maker of human life, can satisfy the heart's deepest longing. Yes, Augustine was the one that put it into words. Yes, it was his experience and his words. But those words express something true, not just for him in his time, but for all times and all people. The human heart, that is the center of the the core of the, the human person, is restless. We have a restless heart, a searching heart, and nothing this side of heaven, nothing this side of heaven can give us a fulfillment that's lasting and deep and comprehensive. And because we were made by God and made in God's image and made for God, well, it makes sense. It's almost logical, you could say, that the only way that we're going to find deep peace is in relating to God. So there's a certain kind of of coarseness to what Augustine is saying. If we were made by God and for God and in God's image, well, it's only fitting that life must be lived out with the maker of human life always in view. And the full quotation actually actually says just that. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. That is to say, what Augustine is giving us is not a lament, a description of the restless heart, but a note of praise. You've made us for yourself, O God, in this restless heart comes to find its true place, its true home, when it rests in you. Again, made by God, we have a creator, made like God in God's image, made for God. God is our fulfillment. And so we find peace. We really flourish when we live according to the design that God has for our lives, delighting in God and walking in God's ways. And until we acknowledge this, until we habitually live this way, there will be a restlessness in our lives. We'll try to fill this emptiness in our hearts that can only be filled by the maker of human life. Now again, Augustine was speaking undoubtedly from his experience. He confessed this great restlessness that he had before he came to know the great peace of God at his conversion at age 31. And that restlessness was something that he had to watch over from from then on. But the testimonies to this human restlessness, the sense of a God-shaped vacuum in us, uh, they really abound in, in every age, in every age. We can find members of the human community testifying to the restless heart. We can see the restless heart in the lament of Solomon in biblical times. Solomon, who pursued, he said, everything under the sun, considered everything under the sun, and yet he was wearied by all the dead ends. Solomon was long ago, but the same truth, the same truth bleeds through some people in our own age, some songs in our own age. I think of the country song popular a while back. Uh, It was the lead song for a movie, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. I think of the Irish rock band singing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. 
It's not just the tune to that song that gets uh, you to the group that sings it. It's not just the tune to that song that gets them a following. They're expressing something we all know about the human heart. So when they sing that song, we say, that's us. That's humanity. Now, it would be easy to go on with the evidence for the restlessness of the human heart. I can make a long list of all the dead ends that lead nowhere, that promise fulfillment. I could number all the false promises made by a hedonistic life, a consumerist life, with lives that try to find bliss, bliss, lasting and deep, comprehensive bliss, without finding peace and delight first in God. I can make those lists. But the important thing here is to focus on the positive. Augustine found God and was found by God. So I want to leave us with that saying of his and make, making only two further comments. By speaking of resting in God, Augustine did not mean to encourage laziness or slothfulness or indifference. And maybe an analogy helps here. We know from sports science, from kinesiology, that muscles work best when they're relaxed. We could even say that a relaxed muscle is free to be itself, to do what muscles do. What do muscles do? They work. And when muscles are relaxed, they can work efficiently and gracefully. So maybe that illustration can speak in a small way to what we're talking about today. As muscles are able to be the best they can be when they're relaxed, so too for the human self. When we acknowledge that God is our end, God is our purpose, life with the controlling hand of God on all we do and all we love and all we pursue, when that's the case, then we can really flourish. We don't become slackers. We don't withdraw from activities. We don't disengage from society. Hardly. Aligning with God, seeking God, making God's glory our chief concern, that gives us a new vitality. It keeps us energized and alive. And when that happens, there's a certain gracefulness. A certain gracefulness almost immediately appears in lives that are given over to God and find their rest and contentment in God. There's that beautiful passage in Philippians where Paul says, I've learned to be content in all situations. He learned that by resting in God, not being inactive, but by trusting God, finding his center in God. And we see it in Mary, too, in, in that beautiful passage where she, she sings the Magnificat, where she blesses God, where she shows God to be her chief concern. There's a purity of heart, a purity of intent, a composure, a grace, a gracefulness that floods into the human life and begins to change how we live begins to change how we live when we find that we can rest in God, that our hearts can be set in God. T.S. Eliot, who was a great lover of Augustine, used the phrase, we can be still and still moving, still, stilled, composed, content, and still moving, ceaselessly exploring, because we've become like a planet now in God's orb. We're in God. We're tethered to God. We're centered outside of ourselves in God. There are many ways to put this, but the point is there's a marvelous settledness that comes into our lives when God, the God of the gospel, not the God of our imaginations or creations, but when God becomes our greatest good. When we make it our settled conviction that we were made by God, like God, and for God, this peace is never far away. Never far away. So rest never means... This rest in God never means inactivity. The second point is a very brief comment, and that's just to go back to the fact that we have a restless, searching heart. What we can learn from Augustine here is very important. He came to see that our hearts were made to search for love. Inevitably, we love things, but also inevitably, we love the wrong things or we love the right things in the wrong way. And it was Augustine's great insight to say that ordering our loves with God's controlling hand on top of them or in them all, working in all of them, is one of life's chief projects, the chief project in life. 
we can learn what he learned, that our hearts were made to search for love, but that God has to have lordship over this process. In the gospel lesson today, and I did preach on the gospel lesson today, and I apologize for that for those of you who were seeking the customary exposition of scripture. But in the gospel lesson today, even as Jesus launches his public ministry, the Son of God seeking humanity, God seeking humanity in the person of the Son, even as he does that, we read, and all the crowds were searching for him. And that kind of generated my thinking about uh, this sermon on Augustine, this little talk on Augustine, reflections on Augustine's famous saying. Because there we have God in search of humanity and humanity in search of God. And what Augustine learned was that even as God put this restless heart in him, searching for love, searching how to love, what to set his heart on, even as he did that, he came to learn that God was always seeking him. God ceaselessly, brothers and sisters, ceaselessly turns to us so that we can know and then model that contentment in God and that composure, that peace, that final rest, even as we live very busy lives, that final rest we can know even now because it's a form of joy. And so in a real sense, when we hear that saying that I'm leaving you with, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. The emphasis and the joy should probably come on that first part. You've made us for yourself, O Lord. Hallelujah. Join me in praying to our Heavenly Father. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we may all be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially for Philip, Victoria, and Elizabeth, for Laura, Molly and Greg, for Dick, Sonny and Denise, for Edie, Tony and Olivia, and for Zoe, Tom and Becky, and for all those affected by the coronavirus, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. And teach us, O Lord, to listen, to hear, to live the words that Christ himself taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.